Good evening, draft fans across, the, I mean, the internet's international, right? Yeah. So we are beaming out to the entire globe. Welcome to the 2016 NBA Draft Evening live show, pre-show from SB Nation Studios here in New York. We're presented by L Certified by Lexus, the good folks at Lexus. We've got a huge show for you. I'd like to introduce the gentleman sitting at the table with me, of course, Mike Prada, SB Nation's NBA editor, and Ben Epstein, the co-host of the Limited Upside podcast That's with right. Mike Prada and just all around good guy. Uh, we've got a heck of a show for you tonight. We've got Coach John Calipari. We're going to hear from him. He's going to be talking about a couple of prospects from Kentucky. We have Philadelphia's own DJ Jazzy Jeff. Mm -hmm. We've got SB Nation's own Ricky O'Donnell, our college basketball editor, who's going to weigh in on a couple of the, uh, the college prospects, especially perhaps later on in the first round. And of course, we have our friends Seth Rosenthal and Roger Sherman, if we can get a quick look in at them, because they are having a Knicks draft party. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, wow, look at this. We're super excited for the Knicks draft this year. Uh, we got Derrick Rose. Everything is looking up. We had a bad year last year, but this year, with a great draft pick, we think the Knicks can put it together. Woo! Woo! Go Knicks! Woo! Yeah, so they might be receiving some bad news. They, uh... Let's just let them figure this all out organically and let them they have They sounded happy. They sounded happy. By the way, you look great with your Boston jersey underneath the plate, sir. I'm, I'm right. actually a Celtics fan now. You yeah, are a Celtics that's, fan that's now. That's what I am. You've got, we got Philly right here representing. We've got Los Angeles here because, honestly, these are the three biggest stories, the first three picks in the draft. Uh, and I think we should just get in and talk draft stuff. Let's To you, Prada, we'll start it. What to you is, because there hasn't been, I guess, a huge trade, and we anticipate a night of trades, but there hasn't been a blockbuster trade. You know, obviously, George Hill, Jeff Teague, Derrick Rose goes to the Knicks, but nothing really involving draft picks significantly in the lottery. Atlanta moves up to, to the 12 pick, but when you look at the lottery, and even the top, what stands out to you? Everybody wants to get out of this draft. Yeah. Nobody likes this draft. Yeah. And it's, here's the thing about trades, right? You always need a team to want to come in, mm -hmm. and I don't really see that right now. As far as intrigue, I think you start at number three with my Boston Celtics. <laughs> my Boston, Boston Celtics. Celtics. That sounds good, by the yeah. way. I like that. <laughs> uh -huh. This is kind of where the draft really starts. I think mm -hmm. the Celtics want to make a statement to free agents. They want to get in the room with Kevin Durant. Yep. They're not getting in the room with Kevin Durant with a number three rookie. No. They need a vet. Mm -hmm. And who's going to give it to them? That's where the intrigue starts. Yeah. No, what, what is the big story to you? I mean, obviously, there's one story here. It's the process coming to its, its head here with the Sixers in the number one pick. But yep. I do think that the Boston piece of the puzzle is interesting. And yes. You mentioned that we were kind of waiting for a trade to happen. We were hoping something was going to happen mm -hmm. even before the show started. Now the clock is just ticking until the draft starts. And, yes. And it looks like some fireworks might occur. All right. Prado, we'll start with you. You see the Lakers jersey. You see the Philly jersey. Ben Simmons versus Brandon Ingram. Actually, let's start with Ben because he's he's wearing the jersey of the yeah, number one I pick. Have, I have the selection, right? Ben Simmons, yeah. by all intents and purposes, mm -hmm. is a 76er. That's correct. Is he the best player in this draft? Yeah, he is, Dan. Okay. I mean, I've, I've thought that Ben Simmons was a an interesting prospect from the second I first saw him pick up a basketball, mm -hmm. playing high school basketball in mm -hmm. Florida. And then he kept maturing a little bit. He had his little the, the hiccups, if you will, which will happen when you're in college. We yep. all make mistakes in college. His just happened on a basketball court. <laughs> but he's still no, a good a lot of my then. mistakes yeah. happen on a basketball <laughs> yeah. court, too. I yeah. should say we're both injured basketball players <laughs> right true. now. Yeah. Um, no, but I look at Simmons as a guy who can really change the complexion of a game multiple mm -hmm. ways, not just a shot. He doesn't have to grow into a body. So I don't have to worry about the Sixers putting 20 pounds of muscle on him. Right. He's ready to play in the NBA. Does he fit in with the Sixers? I guess, Prada, first of all, they've got a ton of lottery big dudes from the past mm -hmm. few years, and now they're adding a 6'10 <sighs> point forward. Does he fit into you, or are you more of a Brandon Ingram guy at the top? Yeah, Ben Simmons is an amazing talent. Don't no question about it. <laughs> I've got concerns about him as a player, doesn't shoot the ball from the perimeter, and he kind of was dismissive when asked about it in a pre-draft pre interview. He said, there's nothing to say. You know, I average 20. A lot of guys average 20. Right. you got to improve your jumper. I worry about his finishing. He kind of always finishes with his right hand. We did an analysis in February. 81% of his non-jumpers finished with his off hand. That's, That's kind of weird. Yeah. So if you can't shoot and you kind of don't know what hand you're supposed to use, I think that's kind of a big problem in the NBA. So what, what wonderful is Brandon, talent. What does Brandon Ingram have developed that Ben Simmons does not specifically? Well, I think it's actually sort of the point of what he hasn't developed in a lot of ways. He's okay. 14 months younger, a lot more upside. 
amazing size, great shooter. Mm -hmm. Hasn't quite figured it all out yet. Certainly defensively, we have to see. Uh, he struggled to finish around the rim. Mm -hmm. But he's a pure scorer. He's got the right mindset. He's got a great frame that he can grow into. Yeah. You look at where the league is going, he can play the three, he can play the four. He makes a lot of sense. There are not as many questions. Ben Simmons, don't know. If you can't shoot and finish, like, I don't care how good your other gifts are. That's a problem in the NBA. Any, anything to knock Ingram about? Because yeah. the, the basketball coordination is there, the shot is there, the versatility looks like sure. it's there, and, and also he's skinnier than I am. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's uh, that. Yeah. Um, you know, because we're professional athletes. Yeah, this is true. <laughs> and we want to be at least. I'll say this about, uh, about Ingram. I think that he could potentially be a, a different player than Durant, but any comp to Durant in terms of body build is, right. is you got to separate the fact that Durant's extremely quick. Yes. His feet were made for his body. Sometimes I watch Ingram play and I, I look at him as like a fawn, like a baby deer. Okay. Okay. And, and that's fine. Baby deers, they grow up into being real deer and they get their coordination. But I was a little disappointed in his lateral movement, his overall quickness. And I think if you're making a comp to Durant, who's an elongated small forward or elongated two guard, right. that might not necessarily be Also about 25 pounds lighter at the, at the similar true. time. And in college, Durant was 30 points a game almost. Yes. And, you know, a 10 board. He was a dominant, dominant player. And he can't necessarily say Ingram was as dominant as you might like him to be. Whereas Simmons, despite all the knocks that Mike just said, which are valid, yeah. was still individually a pretty dominant player. Let me jump in here because you're wearing a Boston jersey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Number three, it appears mm -hmm. Bender is off the board for Boston. Chris Dunn, sort of the local guy at Providence, is somebody that a lot of teams are coveting as if Boston needs another combo guard. <laughs> but uh, what do you think is a big win for, uh, for the Celtics at three? Either keeping the pick and selecting blank or trading it. What do you think? I think they got to trade it. And I don't really? think there's a single Why? player. I just think, like I was sort of saying at the jump, mm. they want to show free agents that they're serious. Mm -hmm. They want to get into a room with Durant. They want to say, we won 48 games. We've got all these great pieces. We have a great coach and an amazing basketball tradition. We want to be serious now. We want to win. And we, you know, have can afford to trade a pick like this with all these Nets picks coming. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the message they got to send. The problem is that nobody's biting because this draft really is drops off. And I think, look, they can take Jamal Murray from Cal. He might be interesting. Yeah, they could take shooter. Dunn. They could take Heald. They could even take Brent Bender and change their minds. But none of those guys are taking them from where they are right now, which is pretty good, to where they want to be well, this quick. If they keep the pick, do you, as a Celtics fan, have someone you want them, <laughs> do you want them to take, Mike? Well, I just think... I, I think you meant to guys, say Jalen Brown, of course, yes. not Jamal Murray, but yes. Yeah, the yeah, point Jaylen is that, Brown, yeah. Jalen Brown, I think he would make sense. I think Bender sort of makes a lot of sense for them, even though they're they're ruling him out. Right. He's kind of got that Draymond Green style of game very far sure. away, but he could really, you look at that front court, mm -hmm. they have a lot of one-dimensional guys. He could be transcended in that respect. But he's so far away, he can't really score at this level. I think if you're Boston, you're a playoff team. You want to take the step. All right, we had an opportunity, and this is a unique opportunity to say the least, uh, on an SB Nation pre-draft show to speak with DJ Jazzy Jeff. Yes, the only person you could ever <laughs> think of when you think about Philadelphia sports. DJ Jazzy Jeff about the current state of the Sixers, huge Sixers fan, what he expects from tonight and what he expects of Philly moving forward. Listen up. All right, Jeff, so obviously the draft is about to start, so give me your thoughts as it relates to the state of Philly basketball tonight. Oh, man. Well, you know, I am a die, die hard. Um, I was a season ticket holder before Iverson. Um, so I remember those days, and they weren't too pretty. Um, living through the Allen Iverson days, which were the glory days, and then to now, which um, they can't get any worse. Um, and I hope that's not famous last words. But today is a very exciting day. Are you somebody who trusted the process and believed in the process of sort of amassing draft picks and slogging through some bad years to get to this point? I can't say 100%. I did in the beginning because I thought Sam Hinkie did a really good job at what he put together in Houston. Um, I don't know if he took as long as he took in Houston as he did in Philadelphia and that's where my my trust the process started to become a little bit shaded. I don't want us to, to deliberately tank to, to get the draft picks. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, I, like I said, I'm 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 a honest Sixers fan and I have to be one hundred percent honest. There was a point in time that I did not know anyone that played for the Sixers and I follow basketball. 
Right. You know, and, and that kind of bothered me. You know, we became the laughing stock, and, and that's probably why I'm more excited today than ever because it's just kind of like show me that there was a method to the madness. So if Jeff is the GM of the Sixers moving forward over the next one, two, three years, where are your priorities? Uh, we need a point guard. We need a point guard, and we need shooting. We need good shooting, pure shooting. I was an extreme Buddy Heel fan. Um, I'm looking at all of the, the draft coverage, and everyone is saying that, you know, he can shoot, but that's pretty much the only thing that he can really do. Um, and I understand you kind of got to have more, but we don't have any shooting. How many games are we going to be at next year? How many games will you be in the stands getting excited for the, the building effort? I didn't go to any games last year. Wow. And that was the first year that I didn't go to one game. I opted to watch the games on television, and sometimes I didn't. And that was a pure fan out of pure frustration. Mm -hmm. um, and you will see my face in the house a whole lot more this year because it's pointing up. Excellent. Jeff, thank you very much for your time, and uh, good luck tonight and the years beyond watching these Sixers build into something special. I appreciate it, man. I'm excited. Oh, we love DJ Jazzy Jeff. We love DJ Jazzy Jeff. But now we're going to flip coasts and we're going to talk about the Lakers. All right. <laughs> a young core, D'Angelo Russell last year, Julius Randle the year before, Luke Walton like a week ago. Um, does Brandon Ingram fit in with what it looks like Luke Walton is going to try to do with this squad? Let's start with Prada. Oh, absolutely. And this is sort of goes back to what Brandon Ingram is as a prospect. He fits anywhere. Mm. Yeah. And he especially fits, I think, with this team because they don't have a ton of shooting at the power forward position. They need a guy who can put the ball in the basket. Mm -hmm. D'Angelo Russell, scoring point guard, that's good. Brandon Ingram, also a really good passer. You can play either in pick and roll. Good in transition as well. Very yeah. good in transition, mm -hmm. can defend. I think it's a great fit. It's going to be interesting to see what the Lakers do with Russell, though. Do they keep yeah. him? Do they trade him? That'll right. be interesting really? to see. Okay. Well, it's interesting, too. Julius Randle, one of his deficiencies is his length. Right. Which can be made up here by Ingram. Mm -hmm. So there are some nice uh, pieces that complement each other. Right. I also think if you're starting off as a coach, you're, you're Luke Walton, you love the fact that this you get to trail. come into an operation, you get to come into your job yeah, with... A number two pick in the draft, a guy you can build around who, like you said earlier, Mike, he's like 18 and change. Mm -hmm. So you can really grow a team together. And I think that's nice for a young coach in his first uh, job as well. All right. So the, how much better are the Lakers now rep basically replacing Kobe with Brandon Ingram? Well, I think they're a lot better. The real specter, I think, that hangs over this team is Jim Buss's five-year plan. Yeah. <laughs> like, if you look at this young core, you know, Ingram, Russell, we'll see if they keep Clarkson. I think they probably will. Mm. With know. a ton of cash with this summer all, as well. With right. they, it looks great, but they're all under a lot of pressure to short-circuit this yeah. and sign a big name and get moving. And I think that could torpedo a lot of what they're trying to build. And I think, again, you go back to Russell, what happened at the end of last year, I don't know if the wounds have healed yet. Are you holding on to Russell and is that your guy? Or are you going to do something and trade him for a veteran and maybe look back on that in a few years yeah. and that's a mistake? All right. Fair enough. Interesting. Okay. We are going back to, I love that we're doing this, a Knicks <laughs> draft party in Studio B. Seth and Roger, how are you guys doing? How are you guys feeling? How, I want to go to this party. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> guys. 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 The Knicks draft party is going great. We are so hyped and so psyched to Woo! see who the Knicks pick this year because whoever it is, we're going to boo them. We're going to boo them so much. We're going to boo them so hard, especially if they have like a, like a foreign-sounding name mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, what, uh, what pick do the Knicks have? Oh, that's a good question. Let like, me look. It's got to be a Knicks, bad one. I know the Knicks missed the playoffs last year, so I'm sure we got like a lottery pick, I, I, like top 10, top 5. It actually five. looks like... No, they don't have a first-rounder. They don't have a... a why no. not? Andrea Bargnani. Mm. Oh. Andrea Bargnani. Uh, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm sure we got like a great like second round pick. That's where the value is, uh, man. The second round, we're gonna have a bunch of second the, rounders. The Knicks don't have a second. They actually have no picks at all. It turns out. Oh, well. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna drink some water. Thanks uh, for checking in on the Knicks draft party. Oh. Oh man, that bummed me out. <laughs> that was so that sad. bummed me out. Oh, Knicks no. fans. Uh, that's a it's a real easy transition though because we're transitioning from a team with no picks. <laughs> To a coach of a team who is who's probably the most successful college coach in terms of the NBA draft in recent years, we had a chance to talk with John Calipari and talk to him about 
what doesn't necessarily show up in a, in a scouting report about one prospect in particular, point guard Tyler Ulis. If you talk to any of our guys playing at Kentucky where every game is someone's Super Bowl, where you're trying to win every single game, you're not just trying to win games, you're trying to win them all. Um, the expectations that, that we put on ourselves and then the other expectations that are hanging out there in the wind make this a different environment to get ready for that league. Um, but when you talk about stuff that's not on paper, that is exactly Tyler Eulis. Tyler Eulis um, is going to have a long career. Tyler Eulis will sell a lot of tickets in that league because people are going to go want to watch him play and not believe that he can have an effect on the game at that size. Tyler Eulis, they'll say he's too small. Really? He was the defensive player of the year in our league. They'll say, well, you know, the rigors of the game and his size, he played 38 minutes a game, and if I could have eked out two more, I had to get him out for foul trouble, and I tried to put him out 30 seconds before a shot, a, a TV timeout. This kid, you got to forget about his size. Now, how many teams in the league are posting up point guards? How is Isaiah Thomas doing in Boston at 5'10"? Now, you may say, well, he's more of a scorer. Well, Tyler can score if that's what you want from him. But what's going to happen is every player in that league is going to want to play with Tyler Eulis because they'll get the ball more. Oh, yeah, they'll get the ball more. He will pick up and disrupt defensively. If he's your second unit point guard, you've got a really, really good team. And I think, again, you know, the numbers help him, but they're going to look at him and say, he's too small, I can't. I said that. My whole career, I said, I'm not playing with small point guards. You know what? I played with him, and last year and the year before, he was a big reason for us to win however many 60-some games that we won over that period of time. Well, John Calipari, he probably knows what he's talking about on a, on a certain level. Uh, do you like Tyler Ulis, either of you? I do. I do. Okay, I little, the hip issue has sort yeah, of come out. But little yeah. guy, but little guards have had a good track record in Philadelphia. I like the Sixers looking at him. Okay. I like the Sixers looking at him. I'm in the 24th, 26th pick range. That would make sense. It's he could be a nice transitional piece. He's no Ish Smith, but he can definitely play that second unit point guard, just like Coach Cal said. I did, think he hit it on the head. Did you just compare him to Allen Iverson? Yeah, just, you know, at a, at a size <laughs> level. A just threw wet, that in there. A soaking wet size level. No, it, it's good when you have somebody, you can get somebody in that in the 20s or high teens that you has a very specific strength yes, that you right. can build around. Okay, let's go back to the top 10, though. Let's start with the Kentucky player, Jamal Murray, who's been sort of in the three spot, in the six, seven, whatever. He's certainly a spot-up shooter. People call into question his athleticism. Let's start with you, Ben. Sure. How do you evaluate Jamal Murray? What type of player is he? Yeah, so I think there's this craving now for guys who can shoot at a prolific level. Mm -hmm. If you look anywhere past that specific skill set, you might undermine a guy like Clay Thompson, who came into the right. league with just that. We saw what Devin Booker was able to do. Absolutely, yep. and he was a guy undervalued last year. Mm -hmm. Like, you probably love Devin Booker now. would like to take him in a top five pick. <laughs> this is the opportunity to redo that top five pick you may have missed last year with Devin Booker for a lot of teams. Jamal Murray kind of has what he lacks and maybe explosive athleticism, he makes up in smooth athleticism. Uh, I like a comp to like a Brandon Roy without quite as much slashing, but a better shooter. Gets to where he wants on the court. And guys who can get where they want on the court eventually can get their shot. The one thing I kind of worry about is that lack of explosiveness translates poorly to defense mm -hmm. more than offense. Yeah, and like, see, I know you, you kind of have a little bit yeah, of a See, that's my there. problem with Jamal Murray. I think if you can't defend your position, you talk about Thompson and Booker, those guys are much yes. bigger, <laughs> came in with much better defensive pedigrees. That said, I think Murray can help some teams. I think New Orleans losing mm. Eric Gordon probably this summer, he mm -hmm. can slide right in there. You know, Denver was 26th in the league in three-point shooting. They could <laughs> use a shooter like Murray, play off Emmanuel Moutier. I, think those teams could really use him and you know if he's a second unit player that's okay in this draft yep. uh, somebody that nobody is questioning his defensive uh, acuity is Chris Dunn Providence built more solid like a more solid more explosive version of any of the point guards in this draft yeah. pretty much yeah. so Chris Dunn what does he do for you where would be a great landing spot for him well here's the dilemma with Chris Dunn I think yeah. it has nothing to do necessarily with what he is as a player but right. you look at the teams in that range Boston has my guy, Three Isaiah. Seven, yeah. The uh, the Timberwolves have Rubio, Rubio. The Suns have Bledsoe. The Pelicans have Holiday. These are all pretty good options. Yeah. 
if these teams are going to draft done, they're going to have to decide maybe we move on from those players. And that is right. maybe what they do, but that's a tough decision. So Holiday gone after next year, I believe? Yes. Yeah. So And Rubio, yeah. I mean, I think he would fit great in Minnesota, Chris mm-hmm. Dunn. But Rubio's a pretty good player already. Do you want to trade that away to get a guy who's a rookie in Chris Dunn? Yeah, I mean, there's going to be question marks, I think, asked about what can he produce offensively. He's an inconsistent shooter. There's some inconsistencies in just how he shoots. Yeah. And those mechanical things, I mean, if we're going to knock Ben Simmons for it, we should probably knock. Chris Dunn for it. Yeah. If we're going to say Jamal Murray's a smooth, great shooter, we should probably note that Dunn's not. Right. But you know, at the same time, what he's going to lack there, he makes up for in defensive intensity, yes. some intangibles, and ultimately he projects like an athletic freak like a Westbrook. Maybe. Let's stay with top 10 shooters. Buddy Heald, obviously a player of the year, caliber player, mm. certainly older than a number of the prospects in the top 10. But Ben, when you watch Buddy Heald, yeah. is he somebody that you know, if you're however old he is, 22 years old, 21, 22, he needs to be more NBA ready mm-hmm. than people around him in the draft. Do you see him like that? Yeah, it's interesting. There's an expectation for a senior, a guy who's played four years, who right. really developed into his game. A lot of right. these guys we're talking about haven't even developed into who they will be eventually. Right, they're upside mm-hmm. picks. Exactly. Yeah. But we know we have a good idea who Buddy Heald is. His body dimensions are similar to Dwayne Wade, so we know that body build fits at a wing. Yeah. I think people are going to question, can he get his shot in the NBA the same way he did in college? Mm-hmm. He relied a lot on his step back. Yes. He had some trouble against a very guard-heavy, in-your-face defense that Villanova mm-hmm. ran at them. Um, you know, one of the things that I think can also be slightly, you know, picked apart with that is he's not a great playmaker, ball okay. handler. Those mm-hmm. things you have to do a lot more at an NBA level on the way. Yeah, yeah, all that concerns me. That said, really tough kid, yes. makes mm-hmm. winning plays. I look at Minnesota with uh, Tom Thibodeau coming in there as that he's a Minnesota mm-hmm. player. I don't know where he plays because Levine is there and sure. they have Wiggins, but that he feels like a Minnesota player. And he's a great guy. We should mention this. Like, yes, yeah. people want he to looks be like he will him. be a very good teammate yeah. wherever he ends up, and certainly would add shooting, needed shooting, to a team like the T Wolves. Yep. All right. We're now moving along because we've focused on the top 10, top 15 lottery area of the draft. Let's focus on the back end now. And to help us with that, we have Ricky O'Donnell, college basketball editor for SB Nation. So first off, Ricky, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And how would you evaluate the back half area of uh, of the prospects in this draft? I'm good. I think it's an interesting draft because while this draft has been considered weak because I don't think there's a lot of separation between the guys, let's say, 3 through 14, there are some interesting sleepers towards the end of the draft, and we've seen that throughout the NBA draft in the last few years. But there's been a number of developing second-round picks, guys like Chris Middleton, guys like Chandler Parsons, even Isaiah Thomas, who have uh, carved out pretty nice careers as second-round picks in the NBA. I think that in the late first-round portion of this draft, there's definitely a number of guys who uh, – you know, if things break right for them and they find themselves in good situations, they can definitely carve out good NBA careers. Ricky, let's start off with the player who perhaps has the most famous last name in this draft because his father was an absolute legend in the post in the Pacific Northwest. DeMontis Sabonis, who some people have going as high as maybe 12 to Atlanta. Seems like he'd be a good fit there. But who knows with how fluid this year's draft is looking. How would you evaluate DeMontis Sabonis and how he projects as an NBA player? I really like Sabonis. I think the one thing he lacks is length. Uh, he actually has shorter arms than Wade Baldwin, who's a point guard out of Vanderbilt. Uh, so, you know, I think a lot of NBA teams are focusing on length for rim protection, and Sabonis doesn't have that. But he brings almost everything else to the table. He's one of the toughest players in this draft. He's going to bring a lot of passion and intensity uh, right from the start of his NBA career. You look, he averaged 12 rebounds a game uh, for Gonzaga this season. He had a matchup in the NCAA tournament with Jakob Pertl of Utah. Mm-hmm. Pertl was much more highly touted coming into that game, and Bonus squashed him. He ran him right off the floor. Mm-hmm. Pertl could not hang with him. Uh, I think that his offensive skill set is pretty crafty and uh, more advanced than people realize. He didn't showcase his jumper too much uh, last season. He only took 14 threes, but he made five of them. He was a good free throw shooter. I think that, you know, the shooting part of his game is something that can definitely develop. And if you're just looking for someone who can uh, be a great rebounder, uh, play both ends of the floor to a pretty high level, and have some ability to uh, corral ball handlers defending the pick and roll, I think Sabonis would be a great pick anywhere, uh, you know, towards the end of the lottery or after that. Yeah, Ricky, you look at the finals and you see the way Steph Curry was kind of held in check. You see the value of players that can guard the perimeter. Who are some guys in this draft later later on Mm -hmm. that you think might be able to do that really well? Uh, One guy I like who didn't get much of a chance to showcase uh, his talents in college is Chief Diallo, a freshman from Kansas. He's about 6'9", with a 7'3", wingspan. I saw him at the McDonald's All-American game uh, about a year ago, and I thought he was one of the fastest 
players on the floor. He was absolutely buried at Kansas last season. That's something Bill Self has propensity to do for five-star freshmen. <laughs> he played seven and a half minutes a game. I don't think he he did, he did not play a minute uh, in the NCAA tournament. Just completely buried. He only averaged three points a game on the season. Uh, but I think that you know what he showed on the recruiting circuit. He gives you energy. He gives you speed. He gives you rebounding, shot blocking. He's got the length. And I think his skill set's a little more refined than people give him credit for. Uh, to me, you know, I don't know if he could be at the same level as Nerland's Noel, but I think that that's maybe a rough mold for Diallo to fit in. And when you're talking about someone like Deontay Davis potentially going with the 10th pick in Milwaukee, I think Diallo has a pretty similar skill set, and he'll be available much later in this draft. And on the note of perimeter offense and defense, somebody who also had a year that was sort of unexpected and interrupted because of a coach getting fired, Pat McCaw at UNLV certainly intrigues a number of teams because he's he is skinny, but he can shoot the hell out of the ball and he can defend. What do you make of him looking forward? What is his ceiling as an NBA player? Yeah, I really like McCaw as a sleeper in this draft. Uh, first of all, uh, when he came into UNLV, he was part of a loaded recruiting class. It was number four in the country. Very strange for UNLV. And he was the least highly touted member of that class. However, he was able to get on the floor right away because he's a great perimeter defender. Someone who, uh, you know, he plays the game the right way. He learned to carve out his role on the defensive end. And that's how he got on the floor. That's how he got minutes. And after that, he sort of started to showcase his offensive talent. He's someone who's always been able to shoot threes. He was over 36% both years from uh, behind the arc in college and I think that you know in this draft he does sort of profile as one of those three and D wings that everyone wants right now the frame is very skinny but he's long he's pretty athletic and I think he's going to be able to guard multiple positions someone who I think could defend point guards if he needs to uh, if he bulks up a little bit he'll be able to defend twos and threes so I really like him Colin if he's someone available in the 20s I think he'd be a very good pick. Ricky thank you very much for your time have a good night and everybody follow Ricky, Thanks, Ricky. on Twitter he does a fantastic job both spanning the NBA draft and of course all things college basketball uh, something that we should mention, this summer is going to be probably the most eventful summer that we've ever seen in terms of NBA free agency and movement mm -hmm. and drama yeah. and guys knocking on doors at 12.01 a.m. on July 1st. So what should be known, first of all, about the changes in NBA free agency and where do you think the effects will be felt most? Well, you look at it, the cap is jumping because there's so much new revenue in the yep. league. The cap is making a massive jump from about $70 million, They're projecting $94 million. And Ooh. so what that means is suddenly two things. One, everybody is cap room. Yep. And two, because everybody is cap room and oh, the same free agent class is kind of there, there's the pay structure is going to be all thrown out of whack because not everybody can get Kevin Durant. I know he's going to Boston. He is obviously he's going, going to Boston. To Boston. <laughs> he's definitely not going to Washington. No. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why would he go there? <laughs> so but, weird. But uh, because of that, you know, 18, 19 teams are going to miss out on Kevin mm. Durant. They're yep. going to have to sign some players, and it's not like there are other superstars out there. So that's going to throw the whole pay scale out of whack. Fair. Are there any players you think are going to be those players who are going to get overpaid specifically, Mike? Well, I think you look at a lot of different players. I think one guy that's sort of an interesting lightning rod, given his finals performance, is Harrison Barnes. Yep. You know, we talked earlier about how there just aren't that many good wing players in this draft. Mm -hmm. Ricky was mentioning it. I threw it out in the finals. Harrison Barnes, for all his faults, is a really solid 6'7", 6'8", 3'4", that can guard fours and shoot mm -hmm. the ball and defend fours. That's going to be very valuable. And... If he gets a big contract, does Golden State really want him to be their highest-paid player? I think that's going to be interesting. <laughs> Along the same lines, I think Kent Bazemore from Atlanta is an interesting player. Yep. Those are two guys I look at that, you know, in past years, they're probably $8, 9000000 million players. This year, 16 17 20 22 wow. That's probably shocking for even Ken Bazemore to hear. A team, <laughs> a team that I'm sure cannot wait to overspend and overpay <laughs> mediocre players might just be the New York Knicks. Mm -hmm. So let's check in on the Knicks draft party. A lot of excitement in Studio B. How you guys doing? <laughs> Boo! 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 <laughs> guys, so we learned that the Knicks don't have a draft pick, but that's not going to stop the draft party. It's definitely not going to stop us from booing. Booing is a rite of passage for anyone coming to New York, Okay. And it's a big part of what makes us Knicks fans. So we're just going to find something to boo tonight. Yeah, just in case the Knicks trade into a pick, we're going to be ready to boo them, whoever it is. So right now we're just slipping through the channels and booing whatever comes on. Okay, uh, Law & Order SVU is on the USA Network. I say we boo Christopher Maloney. You know, he's Detective Stabler, I think if he's going to make it on the streets of New York, 
He's got to get booed. He's got to get this trial by fire, the same Boo! one we gave Chris Stops. Boo! 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 Yeah, boo! Boo! All right, they just wow. booed Christopher Maloney on our live NBA draft wow. show. We're really <laughs> sorry, fans of Law and Order. You know. SVU, yes. Um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, this We're sort of nearing the end of the show, but it is summertime now. We sort of have crushes. We sort of, there's, there's, there's a couple players we're, we're sort of in love with irrationally. So we'll start with you, Preda. Who is a player in this year's draft that you just, you can't wait to see play in the league? I'm fascinated by Jalen Brown. Yeah. By Cal. I think there are four reasons. He's kind of on the precipice of four interesting big picks picture issues in the league. Mm -hmm. One is style play, 3-4, we talked about Harrison Barnes, he's that guy, those guys are valuable. He's a one and done that was really highly touted but struggled at Cal a little bit. How do teams value that? He's positionless, you have that. There's also the stats for scouts angle. His stats right. really don't like him, scouts like him. And the other thing is, he's a really bright guy. Yeah. Intellectually bright. Yeah. Does yeah. that mean he's basketball bright? That's an interesting question. I I'm think he's neither, fast. Right now. <laughs> yes. Well, neither am I. Yeah, obviously. Sorry, but, sorry. So that guy, I think it's going to be really interesting to yeah. see how teams value him. It'll yeah. tell you a lot about how they feel about this big picture issues. Yes. Absolutely. Ben, who you love with? So I really like Henry Ellenson. Okay. And he's Marquette, a name, yeah. Marquette guy. Uh, he kind of fits the mold of who you would anticipate playing for Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Imagine the Wisconsin bigs that can do everything, shoot from the perimeter, pass well. Yep. Real natural feel like they didn't grow up playing a big man position, but then they became one. Offensive polish. Exactly. Yeah. And that's how Ellenson plays. Plays. You watch him play offense, and I think one of the big keys here is he was a pudgy guy mm -hmm. when he was like 16, 17. He's lost 60 pounds. Wow. He's moving into his body. You can tell he's trimming out. Great natural stroke. We'll be able to play that stretch four position. He just needs to learn how to play defense, which yes. is a common theme it's here. Common. Yeah. Guys either can't shoot or they can't play D. Yep. They got to learn them. I think he's got all the potential to be there. His, his feet are a little heavy, but real natural stroke reminds me of a, and I hate to use the super cliche, but like a young Dirk or a Ryan Anderson yeah. or a stretch four. I hate to use just like white stretch fours. Like what, yeah. what, about, what about Steve Novak? Yes. Other Mark Stop. Stop. <laughs> yeah, That's not a bad Totally comp. a Novak but, type player. But can play a little bit bigger. And that's yes. why I like him. He's a seven foot two wingspan yeah. guy. He is around seven feet tall. So I like Ellenson. If he drops into the 15 to 18 range, yeah. great value for whoever gets him. All right, I'm going to stay in the Midwest just with Denzel Valentine just because offensively he mm -hmm. can be a wizard. He shoots the hell out of the ball. He's 6'6", great size, sort of in that .3 type mode. You know he's coached really, really well at Michigan State. An amazing passer. They had to hide him on defense, though. <laughs> that he falls under the corollary of like, but he can't. <laughs> so he can shoot, but he can't play defense. Right. So if his knees are okay, and that's a, a worrisome thing with him, and I know you, you're talking about how he might fall out of the first round. I mean, I'm just thinking if the health issues are a real thing, that's yeah. usually how players tumble. And yeah. I'm not, we're not hearing great things about his knees listen so yeah. we'll see what happens to him yeah absolutely but yes he is somebody if he is able to play I think he could make for like a really good seventh man on a very good team if he does fall to like the 28th 29th sure. 30 whatever pick that sounds, uh, sounds a sometimes. little bit like another Michigan State player well, a few does. years ago does it not it does Mateen Cleaves <laughs> we are referencing Mateen Cleaves all right before we go and before we all watch the NBA draft and follow along on SB Nation NBA is that where, is that where mm -hmm. people should yes, be? Yes, where it will that's be. That's where people should yes. be watching. Uh, we are relaunching re the SB Nation YouTube channel in August. We have all sorts of amazing new shows planned, including in real life, where interview all sorts of fun people all over the sports world. We're launching in August, so get in on it right now. Hit that subscribe button on the YouTube page. Tech a look at what we have and what we have coming. Mm. Sports on YouTube. If you're not throwing a basketball out of a plane or stealing highlights, it's a tough gig. Thanks a lot, copyright law. But SB Nation is different. We're smart. We're fun. We're weird. And now we're more focused than ever on making the best sports content on YouTube. So here's what to expect from our channel. Expect storytelling with in-depth profiles of the players, fan bases, and cultures that make sports great. You just blocked a ball that no other human being could block. Expect creativity from our original shorts. They're mostly funny, sometimes strange, but always worth watching. You wanna go watch some kickball around the corner? Expect insight from our explainers and video essays. They're like really informative articles without all that pesky reading. And expect personality with hosted shows like In Real Life with Dan Rubin, Nuff said with Matt Ufford, hey, that guy sure is handsome. Jaden, Braden, leave Caden alone. And John Boyes' offbeat documentary series, Pretty Good. 
We love sports. We're a little different. Yes! And we want to share that viewpoint with you. And for the diehard fans out there, we've got dedicated subchannels for news, analysis, and play breakdowns of your favorite sports. SB Nation is a sports appreciation machine and your source for quality video made by fans for fans. Thanks for watching. And remember, hit that subscribe button. Oh my God, I am worked up. I am excited. Damn, yeah. you're in everything, man. I know, it's <laughs> exhausting. But uh, do hit that subscribe button. Uh, quickly, what should people expect tonight? Trades, movement. Don't get too excited when your team drafts somebody, he might get traded. I think it's going to be a dead night. A really? dead night than we think. <laughs> oh. We got the same problem. Everybody wants out. Nobody wants in. Right. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I fully expect the uh, the jersey I'm wearing, this player right mm -hmm. here, Jalil Okafor, to be traded. Interesting. So, mm. And if it's not him, it's the other jersey I would have gotten, Nerlens Noel. Too many big men on the Sixers. That's going to create moves and then a trickle-down effect. Other moves will be made consequently. As a Lakers fan, I expect championships. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> I expect championships tonight. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching the pre-show here on SB Nation, brought to you by L Certified by Lexus. That's Mike. That is Ben. Stay tuned to SB Nation for all things NBA. Stay tuned to Facebook Live for our after show, grading all things NBA draft with these two knuckleheads. 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.